Hi, my name is Rick Schnabel, and I'm on the online prosperity show with Prosper. And we discuss burnout. We discussed how to completely flip your life to go from the worst possible imaginable place to the best possible imaginable place. So if you're keen to take your life to the next level, please enjoy our program. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you inspiring stories and individuals who have overcome challenges and achieved a remarkable success. I'm your host, Prosper Tarwinga, and today we've got a special guest with us, Rick. Rick, how are you doing today? I am doing very, very well, Prosper. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence on the show today. I mean, in 2021, I was on your show. Now you are on my show. It looks like the tables have turned. I appreciate you, sir. Absolutely. And you did a wonderful job on my radio program. Oh, thank you so much. Well, it does (laughs) take two to tango, you know, because if you were not asking the good questions, I wouldn't have performed the way I did. But for those that are watching right now, you might be surprised. um, What's this bromance all about? Well, me and Rick go way back but that's not why he's here today now he has gone from being the worst salesperson in his company to becoming one of the best in um in in the training industry and all that happened because he untrained his brain so i'm going to invite you today to untrain your brain and learn from the expert himself as he will be uh, letting us know the ins and outs of how he's become a master trainer in NLP and also life coaching. And he's also got under his belt an astounding 38,000 hours of face-to-face transformational experience. He's also an international best-selling author with two top-selling books. One is called A Richer Way to Think, and the other one is Bro, with courage from fear to fearless. Now he's using books, public speaking and testimonials uh, to grow his business when he only started with $27 in the bank and um, almost at the brink of homelessness. Now he's a millionaire. Please join me in welcoming the incredible Rick Schnabel, the founder of Life Beyond Limits. Now, Rick, I could go on and on speaking about your accolades and everything else. And it's a good thing you um, you know, you are in personal development, you wouldn't have that much of an ego. But it's truly inspiring to hear about your um journey from beginning, you know, since you are the worst salesperson to becoming one of the best in the industry. Can you tell us more about how you actually transformed, first of all, your mindset and achieved such a remarkable success? Well, firstly, thank you for the amazing introduction, Prosper. Um, I, I guess the the story really began when when I was in sales, and I had a belief system that essentially was that I was the worst salesperson in the company, and the sales director told me so, in his own words. And uh, I, at the time, this was going back around two thousand and two. And at the time, I certainly did have that belief system. I really did believe that I was terrible at sales. And, of course, I was in a sales role at this particular time. And I was proving my belief absolutely right. And uh, in, I think it was in about eight months, I brought in a total of $3,500. And so you could just imagine, you know, I'm certainly headed for the door. And things are not really looking so good. And uh, my wife shared with me that we were down to $27 in our bank account. Um, That was hell. It was really hell um, to all of a sudden start thinking, you know, here I am, newly married, just had our first child, and we're going to be living in some laneway somewhere in the streets of Melbourne, which, which is where I was living at the time. And uh, it, it was it was a real scary experience because your brain just goes into overload. You start thinking about what are you going to do with your stuff? You know, will you be able to sell it? Will you be able to get some money together? How are you going to get yourself out of this situation? 
and uh, it, it was it was really hellish. And I was also learning. Uh, I was in my last year of learning neurolinguistic programming as well. And so I contacted one of my colleagues and I said, I really seriously need some coaching. And what they did is they started coaching me and they said, well, you know, tell me honestly, what do you think about salespeople? Um, By the way, forgive me if anyone's in sales and they're listening to what I'm about to share, because at the time I really believed it. And, And I believed that salespeople were sleazy. They would sell their own grandmother. You know, they weren't to be trusted. And my coach said, what you've really got is you've got a values conflict here because you like being trusted. You're a kind person. You care about people. You want to be seen in that light. So he said, close your eyes for a moment. So I did. And he said, I want you to imagine yourself being the most successful salesperson in the company. And I remember trying to even get a picture of that, what that would look like. And I'm trying to imagine it. And I just couldn't really imagine it. And then I just came out of the process. And I said, if I was, I'd be the sleaziest salesperson on the planet, I would sell not only your grandmother, but my grandmother too. And um, and he said, there's your problem. He said, you're unconsciously working against your success. So we did some work and I, I began to realize that most of the people that I trusted most, that I cared about most, were the people that cared mostly about me and they were mostly my friends who were in sales. They were the ones whenever you had a problem, they were the ones that would bring a book and say, hey, have you read this book? Or, hey, have you, you know, thought of doing this? Or they, they would offer suggestions, they would offer advice and help. That, right. They were the first people yeah. who, you know, would put up their hands to help you move house. And uh, I really began to realise that, I had a complete belief that was really unsubstantiated. And that belief was what caused the biggest difficulty. So learning NLP and and going through and learning about communication, about building rapport, about, you know, changing your own programs, I made it my mission to change as much of me that I didn't really like. And wow. within three months, I, I became the best salesperson in the company. And I started making annual incomes monthly. And uh, I, I made so much money. And it was such a contrast that the sales director uh, flew down from Sydney to Melbourne to investigate me. And he said, I don't know. I, it doesn't make sense to me. How does, how does a guy who was about to get the sack become the person you would never let go of, you know, who, who would become the top salesperson in the history of this company? How do you do that? And I started sharing with him, you know, the, the fact that I'd learned NLP, that I'd done a lot of work on myself, that I had a coach. And he really didn't want to hear any of that. He right. had an I he had an idea in his mind of what I did do. So I, I actually told him a lie. And and I said that I've been going out and having lots of appointments. And he said, I thought so. I thought that's what you were doing. And um and and he just went, fantastic, let's have lunch and let's celebrate. And uh, that was the end of that. And you know, he flew back to Sydney and and I just went from strength to strength to strength. But to me, it made me realise how potent and powerful our beliefs are. Fantastic. That's such a remarkable story and a turn of events only by shifting your belief system. So would you, you know, um, with your now um, experience and opinion, think that a lot of people are literally sabotaging themselves, stopping themselves from achieving all that they want just 
predicated on the fact that who they want to become is not who they um sort of are showing up as. And, um, you know, can you just shed a bit of light on that? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if we think about how we become who we become and we use a model like logical levels therapy, you know, we've got our environment, it determines our behaviours, our behaviours build our capabilities, our skills and what we're able to do. That then forms our beliefs and our values and our beliefs and our values form our identity, which locks all that in. And then, of course, our spirituality, our purpose, our reason, our big reason why, that's what motivates us, that, that's what puts the fuel in the tank. Now, if a person believes, let, let's say, um, I'll, actually, I'll share a, a personal story rather than use a case history. But when, when I was a kid, I remember being told that I was stupid um, and and this was based on a behaviour. And the behaviour was that I was asked to stand up, you know, in I think it was grade two in primary school and do my eight times tables. And my eight times tables were the worst. I really couldn't work out the pattern of the eight times tables. And I could get up to about 24 and that was it. I couldn't get beyond that. And uh, like 32 just was not there in my brain. So I was there and I remember counting on my fingers and my teacher screamed at me and, uh, and she told me I was dumb, which in front of uh, all those kids, I really felt it and I really felt stupid and, and I carried that idea for much of my life that I actually believed I was stupid and it interrupted my study. Even though I wasn't a bad student, it still interrupted my study. It interrupted my ability to remember. It also uh, configured in ways where I couldn't remember people's names. And so all of this really took down my self-esteem. So if you think about it, that, that's just a belief system. That's literally all it is. I mean, I can remember every single student's name that I have trained in NLP and life coaching for, what, 19 years. I remember every name of every client I have coached in 21 years. So I'm clearly not stupid and I've got a good memory, but back then I really believed that I didn't have a good memory. And it just, it really, beliefs are kind of like an honour and an off button. If you believe it's true, it's an on button. You'll move forward. You'll do what you need to do. Like if someone says, hey, prosper, you can prosper. <laughs> you can be a millionaire. You know, you can be a multimillionaire. You can be a billionaire. If you can believe that, then you'll start, and, and you want that, you'll start developing strategies. You'll start thinking, hmm, am I going to do it with my business? Am I going to do it with real estate? Am I going to do it with stocks and shares? What's going to be my vehicle? And you'll start getting really good at it. But if you don't believe that you could be a millionaire, let alone a billionaire, then you won't even try. And that's the stalemate. Fantastic. And thank you so much. For sharing that story, especially the one when you were at school, because somebody else's opinion re literally shaped who you became and how you approached life and how yeah. you actually interacted with everybody else that came along, which, you know, really begs the question that could we be having a lot of people in these work environments that we are in today that are experiencing Burnout, just because somebody might have told them that they expected to be a certain kind of person and they're showing up in an environment that no longer maybe supports that, or everything has now just become fast paced and they can't find themselves in the way that they were told um, how to show up or something like that. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing I noticed is through COVID and, you know, all of the things that happened through that particular period, lockdowns, lockouts, you know, exclusions, um, you know, people being denied the opportunity to go to work and do what they do. Um, what I noticed is that a lot of people had a sense of fatigue about them. And, 
I I had so many inquiries, you know, people wanting to remove anxiety, remove shift beliefs, shift, you know, problematic ways of thinking, that I started to do some research. And I thought about it. And particularly when COVID got to the point that supply became an issue, and then we started getting interest rate hikes, and we started getting fuel hikes, and all of these sorts of things happening. And what I found is that burnout went right up. It increased quite dramatically, particularly here in Australia. Like in America, you know, they claim it's somewhere around 40% of people. Here in Australia, it's about 89%, you know, oh, sorry, 70%. No, no, sorry, let me get the figures right. It's 89%, but 70% will leave their job as a result. And so... I was wondering what is causing this. So I scoured through many of my coaching notes with many clients and I realized there was one common frame. And that was if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we go to even the first level, which is a roof over your head and food on the table, essentially people lost that opportunity. You know, some people were a little bit scared that they might not be able to keep their home, might not be able to feed themselves, those sorts of things, particularly when they kind of forecasted into the future. So essentially, if you think about it, it, it's a shifting sands. It's a shifting platform, which is base level, level one, survival. And so what that means is people can do incredible things. We've seen people do amazing things through our lives. But people, when they work hard and they're working really, really hard at aiming to achieve or even survive, if the future becomes uncertain, you lose hope and you lose faith right. and you lose your why. And this was why I believe that burnout skyrocketed. You know, people started to say, why am I doing this? Or what am I doing this for? What is the ultimate aim? You know, some people these days, um, you know, I, I coach a lot of people and a lot of people are saying things like, Rick, I'm really concerned if I'm even going to get what I thought I was going to get at retirement. Wow, and so so there there are an enormous amount of people that are very very concerned about the future. Then of course there's lots of people doing deep dives into you know what the hell is going on you know in, around the world, and you know some people are starting to look at you know the World Economic Forum and you know some of the things that they're doing and <laughs> you know and, and so so what's happening is there's a, there's a, there's a loss of faith. Right. There's a there's a loss of, you know, future too. You know, what is the future? Am I going to make it? Am I going to get to that point that I really thought I was going to get to? And then there's for the parents, oh my god, what about the kids? You know, how are they going to be? Are they ever going to be able to afford a home? Are they ever going to be okay? You know, so there's, there's so much disharmony and, and, and the foundations have shifted so much that people are exhausted mentally. And, and, and I think that's, that's behind the burnout that's going on. Um, I was on a program a little while, while ago talking about burnout. And this particular gentleman was a little similar to you, uh, but working with more uh, practitioners, you know, chiropractors and, right. you know, and medical people. And he was saying exactly the same thing. He was saying so many of them are all tired, burnt out, and just wondering, why am I doing this? Oh, I, I, I can imagine, Rick, and thank you so much for elaborating on that, because if you would really look at what happened in the last couple of years, people were told that they are not needed. They're non-essential. Yeah. Yeah. And you can imagine you showing up right now at a place that you were told you were not needed. I think something intrinsically would just refuse to be there. And I, I feel like that's where, you know, their values are now misaligned with where they're going. And you did also raise 
a very interesting topic. Um, you know, the the ones you mentioned uh promised us that you will own nothing and be happy. So <laughs> I believe, I believe, I believe, you know, that's where we're headed to. And there's talk of universal basic income and things of that nature. But what from your perspective and using the modalities that you use, especially NLP and things of that nature. Could you maybe share some effective techniques that individuals can use to actually overcome burnout and find a bit of balance in their lives? Yeah, look, I think firstly, um, there, there are so many questions at the moment. You know, what do I do with my investments? What do I do about retirement? What do I do with my career? And, and the list goes on and on and on. One of the very first things that I think it's very, very important to do is get those things out of your head and onto paper, you know, just so you can get them out of this clutter, this maze of thinking and, you know, start to start to formulate new plans. Perhaps if the, if the old plan isn't completely rigid enough or solid enough to deliver some level of hope, but, the thing that I think is is really, really key is state management is everything. You know, how we feel, you know, I, I used to, well, let me go back a step. I used to believe that it was all about thinking. Thinking was everything. And, of course, I was trained very much in that way. And, to you know, everyone was asking me, hey, Rick, help me change how I think. And I started to discover over the years that it's not so much about what you think, it's about what you feel. And people are not given a manual as to know how to change how they feel. It's, it's a right. very difficult question. Like if someone feels like to, to have a drink of water, okay, that's, that's a basic need. And, of course, you'll go and drink the water. It's a very easy solution. But if all of a sudden where we've got to go somewhere and we just feel a bit icky about it or we don't feel right about it or we feel a bit anxious or nervous about it, there really isn't a self for that. And most people don't know what, what do I do other than feel anxious. So, you know, of course, when we feel and, you know, the, the heart is a brain, as the gut is a brain, as is the head is a brain. Now, 80% of the messages actually come up from the heart. And I remember when I first studied this, I was, I was dumbfounded. I actually thought it would be the other way. I, I thought that our brain, our central nervous system, our neurology up at the top of our heads, you know, really ran the show. But it actually doesn't. Our heart runs most of the show. Our heart pretty much sends up signals and says, I don't feel right right now. And, and the head says, okay, let me look at it. Let me look at the evidence. Let me find the reasons. And then the head starts looking for reasons and it says, oh, don't go. Yeah, I know why you don't want to go to that meeting. Um, last time you were in that meeting, it didn't turn out so well for you. You know, I get it. You know, you, you might be on the chopping block now. You know, you might lose your job right. or, you know, so, so basically what we've got to be able to do is we've got to manage our feelings. So one very simple technique that literally anyone just listening today can do is balance out your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So your sympathetic nervous system is when you go into fight mode, you know, fight or flight. So fight or flight typically is when we <gasps> breathe up or <gasps> breathe in more than we breathe out. So you'll see that if someone is angry, you know, and someone <gasps> does this, step back because, <laughs> you know, they're, they're likely going to throw something or get angry or punch or, you know, you know kick out. But that's your sympathetic nervous system, which is to fight or flight. But your parasympathetic nervous system is to quit. It's when you, when you breathe out more than you breathe in. And you see this when people quit or when people think there's no use. Like in a meeting, someone will say something, you see someone go, and, and you can tell that they in that moment have just quit. 
And, you know, they're not going to be a team player. They're not going to, you know, really embrace what is what has just been shared. And so as a result of that, what we've got to do is we don't want to quit and we don't want to fight. So we want to balance that out. A real simple method is to get your feelings back in order. And the way to do that is just breathe for six seconds in. So just you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then out. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then in. One, two, three, four, five, six, and out again. Six seconds. So if you do that for about, at first, it takes you about a minute. Sometimes it takes you two minutes to adjust your body to get yourself nice and calm and centered relaxed and able to do what you need to do. So basically that balances your whole body out. Now, once you do it a few times, your brain is already going to be pretty quick off the mark. The moment you start breathing in or breathing out for six seconds, your brain will say, ah, I know what you're doing. And it will only take you like 20 seconds or 30 seconds to get yourself back and balanced. It's a really good thing for people who, you know, want to be a public speaker and want to get up on a stage and talk. You know, like I teach all our students of our public speaker course, how to calm themselves before they get up. Now, the most important thing is, you know, how some sometimes uh, I'll use the analogy of a speaker. Yeah. When a speaker gets gets up, the big fear that most speakers have is, what if I forget what I'm going to say? What if I get to that point where I say, um, I don't know what I'm going to say, you know, <laughs> and that would be the most embarrassing moment for them. Right. So, so the thing, the thing that um, I share with our students in this space is I say, guys, the reason that you're doing that is because your amygdala is highly active. And as your amygdala is highly active, it's your fight, flight, freeze, fawn mechanisms. What you want to do is you want to calm that down. So the way to calm it down is balanced breathing, that six-second breathing. Now, what that does is when you balance out, your DNA has a, you know, just like our neurology has myelin sheaths that protect our neurology. And DNA has a thing called chromatin. And chromatin, what it does is when we get stressed or anxious, it squeezes our DNA. So when our DNA gets squeezed, it stops us. It stops our potential. It stops our ability to be able to think and process and be able to cognitively and consciously and professionally and articulately, it stops us from expressing ourselves. So that's one thing to do. Balanced breathing, it's a very, very simple thing to do. Now, if people are constantly finding that the balanced breathing is helping, but they keep being triggered all the time, then that's coaching. That's brain untraining. They've, they've got a trigger there that's basically it's jarring them or it's, or it's triggering a response, and that response has to be dealt with, you know, so that they don't respond in the same way again. So they can respond professionally or articulately or be able to, you know, present themselves in, in a cognitive, calm and peaceful manner. Fantastic. That that was profound. And that is just testimony to the expertise that you hold there yourself, uh, Rick. Now, you did mention <laughs> that you take people, um, you know, for maybe speaking uh, or coaching, um, you know, speaker coaching sort of sessions and things of that nature. It just uh, reminded me of that uh, Seinfeld uh, statement that people would rather, uh, at a funeral, somebody would rather be the one in the coffin than them being the one saying out the eulogy. Now, yeah. you've created life beyond limits. And obviously, you know, when people can speak, then they can close deals, they can maybe open up relationships, they can get funding, and they can actually have a happier 
existence. And this is your brainchild and it's aimed at helping people open their minds um, and get more out of life. Now, can you just tell us a little bit more about maybe what it is that you guys do there at um, Life Beyond Limits and how it actually empowers and, uh, and um, you know, helps leaders be, do and have um, maybe a happier existence or businesses that are profitable and enjoyable? The the thing that we do is we we essentially have two arms. One is a coaching arm, which is, you know, the one-on-one work where we help people to achieve what they want to achieve. The other arm of Life Beyond Limits is the training arm. And the training arm is to help people to build skill. So in our, in our like our life coach and NLP practitioner courses, our level one program. And we get about at the beginning, we get about 50, 50, you know, 50% that want to be coaches and are using it because we offer an accreditation program through it. And 50% are just there for themselves. They just really want to be a better version of themselves. But really weirdly at the end of the program, I ask the same question, who's here for coaching, you know, to be a coach, who's here for themselves to improve themselves. And the 50-50% at the very beginning completely changes. It becomes 70% want to be coaches and 30% are still there for themselves. And that's because a lot of the training is learning skill, but also we practice that skill. So they get a lot of practicing. So by the time they're at the, they've graduated and they're at the end of that program, they're all thinking, wow, I have... I've turned people's lives around. I have literally changed people's lives. And it's a it's quite a buzz, you know, doing that. I, I know personally for myself, um, it's a huge buzz when you, particularly the hard ones, you know, the 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 ones I often get the clients that psychologists just can't help. And they'll say, you know, this client's got this weird thing and I just can't work it out. Rick, you you love that stuff. You know, ha- have a few sessions with them and, and then uh, let's see whether we can get them shifted. But um, I love that space. You know, I, I love potential. I love seeing people, you know, rise. I mean, Prosper, you, you know, you've you got a great story. You know, I, I, I was really inspired when I heard your story. And, you you know, it made me feel fantastic, you know, just the fact that, you know, you, you got yourself, you had a vision of where you want to go and, and you had to work through some big blocks to get to where you are today. And, you know, it's uplifting. It's always wonderful to hear those stories. It's a real, it's a real trophy of humanity, I think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in life, we're here to live, to learn and to contribute. And obviously, for you to live the best life, you have to learn the lessons that are needed. And once you are at the top of the building, send the elevator down just so that other people can be, do and have a happier existence. And I love the transformation stories that you're talking about, because if you're not helping other people you know, have a happier existence, then obviously you will be uh, in turn wasting your life. Now, Rick, how can our audience connect with life beyond limits and benefit from this awesomeness that you're depicting um, on the show today with your solutions, coaching sessions that you're offering? Uh, I guess the best way is uh, just to jump on lifebeyondlimits.com.au. Just have a look around, see what's on there. There's, there's lots of freebies on there. There's uh, lots of different opportunities there. And one thing, um, if if anyone actually wants to go through a training program or wants coaching, we prefer people to contact us to have a conversation rather than just go on the site and you know buy a program or a product. It's always nice to have a conversation first, you know, just to get a sense of what their vision is and where they want to go, and that way we can offer advice rather than them just going in blindly. Fantastic. Now, obviously, part of the thing that you do is help um, other coaches pretty much get started in their business and, uh, um, you know, move on with their lives. Now, starting a coaching business from scratch can be really, really challenging. I mean, not everyone can start at $27, write a few books like you have, and eventually (laughs) turn out to be um, a success. What sort of advice would you give 
um, for those that are um, aspiring to become coaches, maybe they're burnout in their consultative role or in their professional role right now. And um, or those that are already um, on their way to becoming coaches as well to build a lucrative practice that is actually going to be profitable like you have built your, your own business there. I think um, the, the first thing is I often suggest to start it as a side hustle first. You know, keep their cash flow, keep their job, keep their currency, and uh, and then build it as a side hustle. Um, in, in our Level 1 program, we have a thing called the $50,000 Challenge, and it's creating $50,000 part-time as a coach. And the reason that we created that was so that we could show people if you can if you can create fifty thousand dollars part time, then it's a viable business. You know because once you move into it full time, you know it's it's quite easy to get to a hundred, get to one hundred and fifty, and you know much more. But um, you know I'm a big advocate of the work that you do. You know I, I think that one thing that is really really important is. They, ne- they either need a specialist or, you know, they need to learn about how to market themselves and how to package themselves and how to put themselves out there so that they're consumable, so people really get what they're about and really get what their, you know, biggest promise is, what their value is. And that's really quite important, I think, you know, there's if you're running a business, typically most of us are running a business on our own in the very beginning. And, you know, we're everything. We've, we've got hats for everything. You know, we're the admin, the bookkeeper, we're, we're the provider of the service, we're the, you know, the, 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 the marketer, the salesperson, and, and so the list goes on. But you've, you do have to know a little bit about that sort of stuff. And, you know, to, to be able to get yourself out there, you don't have to be an absolute amazing expert like you, but, um, you know, at least moving towards that journey, I think is great skill, really good skill. Fantastic. Well, Rick, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence on the show today. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, particularly with you, Prosper. Absolutely. Your life story and your experience have so much value for people that are watching right now. Even though we just simply wanted to talk about burnout, but I think you came with a wealth of experience that burnout is only a stage. We really needed to see um, the whole enchilada and your story is just a testament to the power of mindset and personal transformation, right? So for those that are watching right now, if you want to learn more about uh, Life Beyond Limits and how Rick and his team can actually help you achieve your goals, I encourage you to visit their website and take advantage um, of the solutions that they are offering. But like what Rick says, reach out to them, have a chat with them because they need to find out whether you're the right kind of person with the right kind of pain that they can actually elevate you to be, do, and have a happier existence. And remember, anything is possible when you open your mind to new possibilities. And I want you to join us again on the Online Prosperity Show for more inspiring stories of success and personal growth. And until next time, stay prosperous.